Hello, this is Mr. Collier, and today we're doing the practice mock exam. Um, so first question is a stats question. Uh, the height in centimeters of each of the 11 students is given below. Find the median height. So we could do this on the calculator, or could we, just, we could do this by hand by just writing these numbers in order and then finding the middle value. Uh, okay, so the smallest one is 157, and then we've got a 158. And then let's look at the 160s. We have 160, 163, 164, 164. We have 170, oops, 174, 177, another 177, then we have a 180, a 183, a 184. Let's double check, see if we have 11, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, so we've counted them all. In the middle, it's going to be what we cross out first and last until we get to the middle. Or you can use your fingers and start counting backwards. And anyway, in the middle we have 174. So the median height is 174 centimeters. Don't forget your units. Okay, interquartile range is going to be, well, you can look it up in the formula booklet. IQR is Q3 minus Q1. Okay, the upper quartile minus the lower quartile, which is here and here. So you're Q3 is that one, and your Q1 is that one. So your <clears throat> interquartile range is going to be um, it's going to be 180 minus 160, which equals 20 centimeters. All right, then we're going to draw this information in the uh, box and whisker plot. So we have the median is 174. So let's just make the dots first. Um, might as well go up here. 175 is just a 174 is right there as the median. Your lower quartile is 160 as we calculated before. Q1. Q3, the upper quartile is 180. And the other parts of the box and whisker plot are the lowest value and the highest value, the maximum and the minimum. So 157. That's 155, 157's right there. And 100, the maximum is 184, which is there. Okay, then we can draw the box and whisker shape. All right, now I can use a ruler to be a lot straighter than this. But that's your basic box and whisker shape right there. So our next example, we have an arithmetic sequence, which means it's going up by the same amount each time. Uh, we're asked to find the common difference, or D. And we know the first term is 3, and then the seventh term is 33. So it's first term, second term, third term, fourth term, fifth term, sixth term, seventh term is 33. All right, so to get each term, you're adding D each time to get to the next term. All right, so to get up to the seventh term, we are adding D six times. So we have 3 plus 6D equals 33. If we solve this little equation, we'll get what D is. Okay, so we get D equals 5. In part B, we have to calculate the 95th term. We can use an equation from our formula booklet. Um, so this equation here, un equals u1 plus n minus 1 times d. So un, which means the nth term, is the first term plus n minus 1 times the common difference. In this case, we're getting the 95th term, so n is 95. First term is 3, we have 95 in here. And the common difference, as we saw, was 5. So that's 3 plus 94 times 5. You can jump straight to the calculator at this point if you like. So 3 plus 94 times 5. 473. 
Okay, and the last one says find the sum of the first 250 terms. Okay, so we're going to use the sum formula from the booklet. Uh, there's two versions. This is easier version. That's if you have the last term or this version right here, which we're going to use. Okay, so we're going to use that version. The sum of the first n terms is n out of 2 times 2u1 plus n minus 1 times the common difference. We're getting the sum of the, oops, and the sum of the first 250 terms is 250 out of 2 times twice the first term. There's 250 terms, and the difference is 5, as we saw before. Okay, you can uh, literally just type that right into your calculator right now. I'm going to simplify a bit first. That's 249 times 5. Okay, so I'm going to use the calculator now. 125 times 6 plus 245. 5 and we get the sum of the first 250 terms is 153,875. 153,875 exactly. Don't round that in three semi figures. Okay, next question. We're given six uh, measurements of baseball bats. Find the exact value of the mean length. Okay, exact value means no rounding here. Um, so to get the mean. Um, get the mean, you add them all up, okay, I'm going to write them all out, add them all up, and divide by, there's six of them, so I'll just divide by six of them. So, let's do that on the old calculator. Okay, at this point, I've got all six of them typed in and added together. At this point, don't type divide by six. If I type divide by six right now, it's just going to divide that last number by six. Okay, you can put everything in the brackets, then divide by six. Or you could do what I just did and press enter. You'll get the sum of those six numbers and then divide by six. And you'll get 104.9. So don't round it because it says exact value. 104.9 is the exact mean. Okay, write your answer in part A in the form a times 10 to the power of k, where, where a is between 1 and 10, and k is an integer. That's a fancy way of saying, put it into scientific notation, or standard form as they call it in the IB. Okay, so we take this number, and to write that in standard form, it needs to be 1.049, okay? The decimal has to be after the first digit here, okay? Because A has to be between 1 and 10. Now this number is between 1 and 10, so it's good. And then it's going to be times 10 to the power of, now we moved uh, 2 to the left here, so this is going to be a 2 because when you do 100 times this number, it's going to be 104.9, okay? Um, there you go. So that's the. Uh, we should probably use our units in both of these. That's our average baseball length in standard form. Okay, next, part C. It says Marion calculates the mean length and finds it to be 105. Calculate the percent error made by her. Okay, so we know the answer part A is the exact answer. Uh, the answer part B is Marion's approximate answer. I'm going to use the percent error formula to answer this one. Uh, so we need to find, okay, there's the very first formula, is percent error. Okay, so the error, E, is the absolute value of VA minus VE or VE, where VE is the exact value. That's what we got in part A. V 
VA is the information they give you in the question. Okay, so we got er um, error equals absolute value of, take a look at that formula again, VA minus VE. Uh, VA minus VE out of VE times 100%. Okay? So we just need to do that fresh. Don't worry about the absolute value and 100%. We'll just uh, figure that out by I in a second. The VA is approximate value. That's uh, Marion's value. And the exact value is 104.9. Um, and then the exact value goes down here again, right? So the best thing to do on the graphing calculator for these types of questions is probably to use the alpha y equals the fraction feature. And in the numerator, we've got 105 minus 104.9 divided by 104.9. Okay, I did that. And in this case, actually, we get a very, very tiny number in scientific notation. I suppose you could uh, actually write this out in scientific notation. And these, these bars here mean absolute value. It means make it positive. This is already a, already a positive number. And we change it to a, a percent. Actually, let's just write down that decimal number for a second. So we got 9.5. Let's use three significant figures. Three. And what this means on my calculator is that's uh, times 10 to the power of negative 3. That equals 0 0.000953. Now I want to times by 100%. I'll get 0 0.0953%. It is my percent error. Okay, next we have a problem about a circle here. The area of a circle is 8, find the radius, so we're going to use the area of a circular, circle formula. Just send your formula booklet, but most people have that one memorized, the area equals pi r squared. So we're given the area is 8, um, so 8 equals yeah, pi r squared. We can solve this, and we get r equals root 8 out of pi. And I'm going to get an approximation for that now. divided by pi, one point, well, I'm going to write out a bunch of digits here, 1.59, which is approximately, if I want three simple figures, 1.60, uh, but we'll see what I'll need in a second. This circle is the base of a solid cylinder with height 25 centimeters. Okay, write down the volume of the solid cylinder. So the volume is, let's check out the volume formula in the uh, formula booklet. Okay, so let's get to those that geometry stuff here. Volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h. So pi r squared h. Okay, so volume equals pi times the radius squared. Now I'm going to type in, uh, I'm going to use a lot of digits here to get a more accurate answer. I don't need three simple figures until the final. I could even use them all since uh, I've got that on my calculator already. And the height is 25, so I just need to do that. And I'll do that on the calculator. Um, so the volume is pi times, I've got that number in answer, and I'm going to square it, and then times 25. There we go, pi r squared h, and we get exactly 200, so it's 200, this is volume, so it's cubic centimeters. Find the total surface area of the solid cylinder. Okay, so surface area is, let's look at the formula booklet, um, so the area, uh, okay, the area of the curved surface of a cylinder is 2 pi r. So we have 2 pi r. That's the area of the curved part of a cylinder. Uh, 
but we don't want to we want we don't want just the curved part we want the two ends of the cylinder as well which which are both circles there's two circles on the cylinder so we have to add 2 pi r squared so that's the total surface area of the cylinder and we already have all the information we need i believe so the radius is 1.595 uh, seven six nine one two two. The height is twenty five, and two pi times the radius squared is zero point five nine five seven six nine one two two squared. So I'll type all that. <clears throat> I'll type all that in, and I'll and I'll round it into three significant figures. So two. Uh, 2 pi times 1.5957691222 two times 25 plus 2 pi times 1.5 Seven six nine one two two squared. So we get two hundred and sixty six points. So I'm going to round it off to two hundred sixty seven. So two hundred sixty seven square centimeters. Three significant figures, and that's it. Okay. Next, the cumulative frequency curve shows percentage marks given to the nearest integer gain by five hundred students in the examination. Okay. Here's the passing grades, or the grades are determined this way. Those scoring less than 50% failed the examination, okay? Find the number of students who failed. So people who scored less than 50 failed. Let's take a look at the cumulative frequency curve. How many people failed? Well, we have 50% the mark is right here. So if we go up and across, and you might do a better job with a ruler, Looks like 200 people are below that mark. So about 200 people failed the exam. Okay, so that would be 200. Maybe you can mark this A, just show your work. Uh, so 200 people. What was the minimum mark reached by the top 100 students? So the top 100 students are these guys. These are the top 100 students. And the top, the, sorry, what was that again? The minimum mark received by the top 100. So the minimum mark received by the top 100. We go across, and that minimum mark is going to be right there, right? Some people scored higher than that. But the minimum mark is right there. Let's draw a line down here to show our work. B, so that's the answer to B. It's 60%. Okay, so 60%. Minimum mark scored by the top 100 students. Find an approximation for the median mark achieved. So the median would be right in the middle of all those students, the 250th score. So we'll go straight across from 250 and go down from 250. I'm not very accurate right now, but if I go down to, from 250 looks like about 50 uh, so that's the answer to part now be very careful here this is going up by two is each square all right that looks like is at 53 actually okay but usually on the answer scheme they say 53 is acceptable maybe 52 and and 54 are also acceptable so I think it's 53 uh, percent. Okay, next example, we have a geometric sequence. First term is 2, the third term is 2.025. Find the common ratio. Okay, so in a, G, in a geometric uh, sequence, the numbers are being multiplied by the same thing each time, which is the common ratio. So we do times r. And then times R again to get up to 2.205. So uh, 2 
times r times r equals 2.205. So it's like 2 r squared equals 2.205. So we can just solve this little equation to find r. Okay, so we're going to get r equals square root of 2.205 divided by 2. All right. So 2.205 divided by 2, and then I'll, I'll take the square root of that answer. So r is 1.05. Okay, r is 1.05, the 11th term uh, of the sequence. So let's use the formula for geometric sequence from the formula booklet. Um, Okay, from the formula booklet, we have un equals u1 times r and to the power of n minus 1. So un equals u1 times r to the power of n minus 1. And we are asked to, what are we asked again? We are asked to find the 11th term of the sequence. That's u11 equals u1, which is 2, the first term. Uh, r is 1.05. And to the power of 1 is 11 minus 1. So that's just 2 times 1.05 to the power of 10. And let's use the calculator for that one. 2 times 1.05 to the power of 10. And we get the 11th term is approximately oops, 3.5. Uh, 2, 6. Okay, press C, the sum of the first 23 terms. Just use the formula from the formula booklet. Okay, there's two formulas that you can use. I always use just the first one. And we'll, let's use that one to find, the, find this amount. Okay, so we have, oops, we have uh, U1 times r to the power of n minus 1 over r minus 1. Okay, so the first term again is 2, and r is 1.05 to the power of 23 minus 1 out of 1.05 minus 1. Okay, so let's do that on the calculator. Easiest thing to do is alpha y equals, and we get 2 times 1.05 to the power of 23 minus 1 out of 1.05 minus 1. And we get 82.9. So that's about 82.9. Okay, next we have a money conversion question. Pay close attention to special instructions in bold like this one. It says uh, your answer has to be correct to two decimal places, which is pretty common with financial questions. So remember that at the end. Go back and check and make sure you have followed that requirement. Okay, Isabel is traveling from Geneva to Toronto via Amsterdam. She changes 1,240 Swiss francs to euros. The exchange rate is 1 Swiss franc equals 0 0.7681 euro. Calculate the amount of euros Isabel receives. Okay. So we're going to take the amount of money that she has right now, 1240 uh, Swiss francs. And we're going to multiply by conversion factor to get that into euros. Okay, so this Swiss francs, we want that means we want Swiss francs down to the denominator here with our conversion factor and we're changing two euros when we do this multiplication these things will cancel so this is what we need to do so we have one Swiss franc you see this one Swiss franc equals 0 0.7681 euros so this is what we do uh, we just multiply and then we'll get that amount so let's do that on the old calculator uh, so we have 1240 times 0.7681 equals 
equals 952.44. 952.44. Four. We need to round to the nearest two decimal places. And our answer here is in euros. Okay, next, uh, part B. Isabel then changes 750 into Canadian dollars and is charged commission. Okay, so we need to multiply by this exchange rate and then it also charges commissions. So let's take care of maybe the commission first. Um, so if you're charged this amount of commission, then that's going to be subtracted from your total, right? So let's find that amount first. 750 times this as a percent is 0 0.0312. So let's find the amount that they're charging. So 750 times 0 0.0312 is $23.40. So they're charging $23.40 for the transaction. Uh, so the amount of money you actually have right now is going to be $7.50 minus that. So let's do $7.50 minus 23.4. Okay, so what you actually have is 750 euros, or sorry, 700, 26.60. 72660, okay? All right, we're going to take that and change it into euros. So we have 726.60, so that's your amount of euros. Oops. Uh, and you're going to change that to Canadian dollars. So you're going to multiply by conversion factor to get Canadian dollars. So here your conversion factor, you need Canadian dollars in the numerator euros in the denominator so the euros units cancel and we have one Canadian dollar equals 0 0.7470 euros so you basically can do uh, this number divided by this number will give us our answer all right so I already have that number on the calculator so it's just times oops actually I'm dividing you divide by 0.7 Four, seven zero, or just seven in there, and then we get seven hundred, or sorry, nine hundred seventy-two Canadian dollars and, and sixty-nine cents. Nine seventy-two dot six nine Canadian dollars. Okay, next we have a linear equation question. It says write down. That means you don't have to show any work. It should be fairly easy. This the gradient or the slope of L one. So the gradient in this case is the number in front of x. Remember the other one's the y-intercept. The gradient of L1 is negative 2. Okay, then we have another line called L2 that's perpendicular to L1 and passes through this point. Write down, so no calculations required, the gradient of L2. So the gradient of L1 is negative 2. We can also call that negative 2 out of 1. And because they're perpendicular, the gradient of L2 is going to be the negative reciprocal. So it's going to be the negative of negative 2, so it's going to be positive. And the reciprocal means you flip the fraction, so it's going to be half. So it's going to be positive half. Flip the fraction and change the sign. Uh, so next, we're going to find the equation of L2. Well, we know the slope of L2 is half. Oops, that is n. So we have half x. And we don't know the y-intercept. Uh, we're going to have to substitute in the point to find the y-intercept. So we're going to substitute in. 4 comma 5 to the equation and we'll find B. So that's 5 equals 2 plus B and we'll have B equals 3. So the equation is Y equals half X plus 3. Next write down the coordinates of the point of intersection of L1 and L2. Well, here's L1 uh, 1 is negative 2x plus 5, or maybe I should, I should say y equals that. L2 equals uh, half x plus 3, sorry, y equals half x plus 3. All right, so to find the point of intersection, uh, well, actually, you could type that in your calculator to get the point of intersection. That's, actually, let's do that. That's probably the easiest thing to do. It says write down so you don't have to show any work either, right? You could uh, 
set these equations equal to each other and then solve for x or you can graph it here so maybe I'll do it both ways so negative 2 x plus 3 and half x so I us do 0.5x plus 3. I should be able to see this under normal zoom. Oh, wait, well, I got the first one wrong. It's supposed to be a plus 5. Okay. Um, so zoom 6 is standard zoom. I should be able to see the point of intersection. And I can. So I'm going to go to the second function, calc, and find the intersect, which is number 5. I can press enter, enter, and enter on this, and we should find it, and it is 0.83.4. So the point of intersection is 0 0.83.4. No need to show a sketch in this case. Normally you show a sketch to show that, show what you did in your calculator, but it says write down, so I don't need to do that. Okay, next a logic question. We have three propositions, P, Q, and R. Write the following statement in symbolic form. If this is a good movie or soundtrack is original, then it'll be worth watching. So it's an if-then statement. Uh, it's going to be separated with an arrow, right? If this movie is good, that is P. Or is that the soundtrack is original, is R. Now technically you need these things to be in brackets, and that implies it is worth watching is Q. Okay, so that is it in symbols. Um, then we're filling out this truth table here. So P or R. P or is only false if they're both false. Um, so remember now we're looking at P and R here. Only false if they're both false. So that would be here and here. Right? Or is only false if they're both false. So the rest of them are true. Okay. Next, P or R implies Q. All right, so P or R implies Q. So we're looking at from this one, this is the first thing here, and then implies Q. So we're looking this way, this and this. And remember, uh, well, let's look at the formula booklet. Just so you can kind of figure this out. The formula booklet, uh, here's implication, it's only false when the first thing is true and the second one's false. TF, we're looking for TF and then we get F in the implication. So I'm looking for T in this column and F in this column. So I have a bunch of T's on top here, so T, F, T, 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 F. I have a TF in the first column, T then F. So that's a false. I have another TF here, see this one's T and then this one's F, so that's a false overall. This is TT. Now this is FT, not the same as TF. And this is TF down here. So the rest of them are not T then F, so the rest of them are trues. Okay, discuss the validity, uh, validity of the argument. Uh, it's not a valid argument because it's not always true, or it's not a tautology because it's not always true. Okay, next example, we have a quadratic function and we have to find the value of a. All right, so they give you f of two equals five. So that's like a point where the x value is two and the y value is negative five. So we have a point and we can substitute in the point and find the value of a. So negative 5 equals 5 minus 2 plus a times 2 squared, which is negative 5 equals 3 plus 4a uh, minus 3 from both sides. So we get negative 8 equals 4a divided by 4, and a equals negative 2. Okay, part b. Find the equation of the axis of symmetry of the graph y equals f of x. So uh, this is one of the few formulas that is related to this in the uh, formula booklet. Uh, let's take a look. 
left here. Let's see. Here we go. So this is the formula booklet. The equation of the axis symmetry is x equals negative b out of 2a. Very useful little formula. So x equals negative b out of 2a is the equation of the axis of symmetry. Let's just rearrange this a bit first, though. Now we calculated a is negative 2, so I'm going to write negative 2x squared minus x plus um, 5. So now it's in the correct order. And in our equation, now that's not, this is a different, actually the same a we're talking about here. So the b value here is negative 1. The number in front of x is negative 1, so it's negative negative 1. I have 2 times, and the a value is negative 2. And we have the x symmetry is going to be 1. Um, that's going to be 1 out of negative 4, which is just negative 1 quarter. So the x symmetry is x equals negative a quarter. Okay, I write down the range of this function. Um, well, without graphing, I guess we could graph it on our calculator real easy. Um, but since I know the a value is negative 2, I know it's going to be pointing down. I know the vertex is going to be at, uh, well, the x symmetry is going to go through the vertex. So that point is negative uh, 1 quarter. And then whatever the y value is, less than or equal to that is going to be the range. So we need to find the y value of the vertex. You can do that on the graphing calculator. Or you could uh, work it out using the equation. So negative 2 times negative a quarter squared minus negative a quarter plus 5 will give me the y value there. So I'm going to do that on my calculator. Uh, negative 2 times negative a quarter squared minus negative a quarter. Five point one two five. So the y value there is five point one two five. All right, it's just the y value that's right here. Anyway, all the 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 quadratic is pointing down, so all the y values of the function are below or equal to five point one two five. So the range is. Uh, y is less than or equal to 5.125. Okay, so next question. Uh, Toronto's annual snowfall x in centimeters for the past 176 years is recorded here. Uh, so this means that 30 of those years, the snowfall was between 2 and 6, and like 14 of those years, the snowfall is between 26 and 30 and so forth. Write down the modal class, so that's like the mode uh, for group data. Uh, so the modal class is the one that hap the class that occurs the most here. That will be this one, right? We have 32 as the frequency here. So look for the biggest frequency that is 32, or well, not don't don't write down 32. You have to write down the class, uh, which is 14 is less than or equal to x is less than 18 is the mode modal class. Write down the mid-interval value of the class 6 uh, less than or equal to x is less than 10. So the mid-interval value is 8 here, or 8 centimeters. It's right in the middle. Okay, that's important because that's our best guess uh, for the average snowfall of these 26 years would be 8 centimeters. And that's going to come into play in a bit. Uh, calculate an estimate for the number for, or for the mean annual snowfall. So for the mean annual snowfall we need uh, we need the mid interval value for all these classes so like 4, 12, uh, 16, um, 20, 24, 28. So we have our amounts and we have our frequencies. You could work this out by hand by doing um, you do 4 times 30 plus 8 times 26 plus 12 times 29 plus 16 times 32 plus 20 times 18 plus 24 times 27 plus 28 
times 14, that's a lot. Divide that by the total number of years, which is 176. So you can work that out. I'm also going to show you how to do that with a list on your calculator. Um, so if you want to type in these numbers, you can go to Stat, Edit, and if I want to clear the list, I go up and press Clear, Enter, go up and press Clear, and Enter. And so I'm going to type in these here under X, so 4, uh, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28. And then I'm going to type in the frequencies, 30, 26, 29, 32, 18, 27, and 14. Okay, I got them all in there. And then most of our statistics we can do under stat and under calc. You might be tempted to use two variable statistics, but it's only one variable and a frequency, so it's one variable statistics. And in this case, we need a frequency list, so I need L2, which is down here. Second function, L2. Enter, enter. Okay, and we're asked to find the mean, which is right here, 14.7, which you'd also get if you did this calculation. So 14.7, uh, and this is centimeters, so your mean is 14.7 centimeters. So that's not A, that's D. Uh, sorry, C, C, C. Part D, find the number of years for which the annual snowfall was at least 18. Uh, so if we look at this table, at least 18 would be, well, these are at least 18. They're between 18 and 22. These are at least 18, and these are at least, at least 18. So we need to do just 18 plus 27 plus 14. Uh, which equals, well that's 41, 51, 59. So that's 59 years out of 176 in which the snowfall was at least six, at least uh, 18 centimeters. Okay, next we have a geometry and looks like a trigonometry question. Uh, Let's read the question first and look at some important stuff. So actually the AF is 8, BF is 9.5. All that's in there. One important thing that's not shown in the diagram is ABC is a square. That is important. That means this is equal to this is equal to this is equal to this. Okay, because it's a square. So that's going to be a little, uh, pretty important a little bit later on. <clears throat> Calculate the length... Uh, of a b so let's call it x for now and we actually have two other sides in this right tr right triangle so we can use pythagorean theorem and work that out so i'm going to do that right here x squared plus 8 squared equals 9.5 squared um, so x squared equals 9.5 squared minus 8 squared and x equals the root of 9.5 squared minus 8 squared, that's going to give me x. Let's do that on the calculator. Alright, so root 9.5 squared minus 8 squared. Okay. That is, now we might need to use this number later, so I'm going to write down more digits and then round it. So 5.12475, 5 5.12475, 5.12475, uh, 5383, which is approximately 5.12 centimeters, okay? Uh, all right, next, M is the midpoint of EF. So let's write that in there. These two segments are equal, and maybe they'll come into play. Calculate the length of BM. BM is, let's try to draw a nice straight line. BM is right there. We've got to find that length. And let's see, what can we do here? 
BM. Oh, okay. We've just calculated x, which is 5.12, which means this length is about 5.12, and half that length, we can find this length, which is about half of that, and then we can find, uh, let's call this, well, let's just call it BM, and then we're going to find BM, all right? So this length here, FM, is half of 5.12. I actually got that on my calculator, so I can divide by 2, and that's about five or 2.56. That's 2.56, and then we can find BM using uh, this right triangle. Okay, so BM is the hypotenuse, so BM squared equals 9.5 squared plus 2.56 squared. So BM equals square root of 9.5 squared plus 2.56 squared, which equals, so now on my calculator, I've got the more precise answer, uh, version of 2.56 there. So I'm going to square that. Just press the square button, and it's going to square that 2.56 plus 9.5 squared. So that's the sum of those squares. Then I'm going to take the square root of, oops, square root of the answer that I have there. And that is 9.84. Actually, I'm going to write out the digits again just in case I need to use it. No, I'm not. 9.84 centimeters. Okay. So I've got that, and part C, find the measure, this is a tricky one, of the angle between BM and face ADEF. Okay, so face ADEF is this rectangle down here. Okay, so well, I'm gonna find, if I want to find the angle between a line and a face, all right, and this, this is the line BM, I need to draw a line directly under BM, like so, and that's the angle we're looking for right there. Okay, that's a right angle. It's a right, uh, right angle triangle. And in order to find theta, we have opposite and hypotenuse, which is sine, right? Opposite and uh, hypotenuse. So we're going to use sine. Sine of theta equals opposite over hypotenuse, uh, which equals, I said the opposite is 5.12. 5.12 out of the hypotenuse, which is, we just found is 9.84. Okay, so theta equals the inverse sine. 5.12 out of 9.84. All right, so we're going to get an approximate answer in a second. So second function, inverse sine, 5.12. Uh, so I type 5.12, and we might not need it, but we can use more digits that we had written down before just to get the most accurate answer, but it's probably going to be okay. All right, divided by... The hypotenuse, which is 9.84. Actually, we have a more accurate version there stored in answer. So we could just do that. Inverse sine of that gives me 31.4 degrees. Okay, so 31.4 degrees is the measure of theta. Okay, next we have a normal distribution question. The big hint is it says the weights are normally distributed, so you never use normal distribution unless it says in the question that is the, the data is normally distributed. Uh, so the mean is uh, 76 kilograms, that's the, the symbol for mean that we sometimes use. Standard deviation is 7. Sketch a diagram showing the distribution. So if I draw the bell curve, that's uh, not a very good bell curve. Let me try to do that a little bit nicer than that. All right, that's good enough. Right in the middle of the distribution is the mean, which is 76. Then you go one standard deviation above, two standard deviations, three standard deviations above, 
So you keep adding 7. 83, 90, 97. And we go backwards. 1, 2, 3. Uh, subtract 7, and you'll get 69, 62, 55. And that's a fair sketch of the distribution. Part B, find the probability a randomly selected adult weighs less than 65 kilograms. So here's 65 kilograms here. So less than 65 is going to be all of this. And if you know something about these distributions, that's about 2.5 percent. It's about 5 percent, I think. But we can get the exact, uh, or a much better approximation using the calculator. So it's under distribution because it's normal distribution. So second function distribution and normal CDF. Never use PDF, or never in, in math studies will we use PDF. Okay, let's use CDF. And your lower bound, well, we know the upper bound is, um, is what, what do we say? Well, 65 in the question, right? Um, so what we're getting, let me just write this out. So we're getting the probability that a randomly selected uh, variable x is um, less than 65 kilograms. So that's the probability we're working out that x is less than 65 kilograms. So your upper bound is 65 kilograms. Your lower bound can be any number less than 65. So technically negative infinity. I like to use negative 10 to the power of 99 because I think that's uh, one of the biggest numbers your calculator can handle. Okay, and then I press enter, enter, and we have the mean is 76, standard deviation is 7, and then press enter, and I'll give you your answer. Enter again. So 0 0.0580, 0 0.0580, you can leave your answer as a fraction, but it's, uh, you can also write it as 5.80%, three significant figures. Okay. Part C, the heaviest 10% of the group participate in a diet and exercise program that, um, what is the weight W of the lightest adult that will participate in the program? So the heaviest 10% are over here, right? This is 0.15%. This is all together here, 2.5%. So 10%, the top 10% or the heaviest 10% are going to be like this group. And this is W right here. We need to find W in order to find the weight of that person. Okay? So we find uh, this W and then 10% is going to be greater than W, right? We're going to use inverse normal on our calculator, but... Um, but you can't... Use your calculator to type in 10% to get the answer. You have to look at how much is less than W. Okay, so less than W, we have 90% of uh, the data is less than W. Okay, so the probability, uh, we're given the probability that the weight is greater than, sorry, the, I should say weight is greater than W is 0 0.1. Okay, that's the same thing as saying the probability of the that the weight is less than W is 0 0.9. Okay, so this is what we're going to do on the GDC. We're going to do inverse norm on GDC. Okay, so that's under the same section, distribution. You go to distribution, inverse norm is number three. And area, they're talking about the area that's less than W here, so that's 90 or 0.9. Uh, the mean is 76, standard deviation is 7, and there we go, it's 84.97, rounding to three significant figures, that's 85.0. So that's 85.0, and what do we have here? Kilograms. All right. So 
of these weights are above uh, 85 kilograms and 90% are below. Okay, next we have, uh, looks like a compound interest question. And, okay, Julio and, or Luigi and Judo, Judo win a $2,000 prize and they make investments and Luigi makes 3.5% uh, per annum per year compounded annually and Judo is getting compounded monthly. Okay, so K equals 12 in this case and K equals 1 in this case. Okay, that's the number of compounding periods, so 12 per year and 1 per year for uh, Luigi. Alright, so that's going to come into play in our formula in a second. So how much interest did Luigi make on his investment of 5 years? So Luigi made, and we're going to use the formula from the formula booklet. There's the compound interest formula. FV future value equals present value times all that. Let me write it up. Uh, future value equals present value times 1 plus R out of 100 K to the power of N K, N times K. Okay, and in Luigi's case, uh, present value is 2,000. And we have 1 plus the interest rate is 3.5 out of 100. K is 1. We can write down times 1 or we can just leave it as it is. And then we have K times N up in the numerator. N is the number of years, so it's just 5. And we can work that out on the calculator. Let's do that. 2,000 times 1 plus, and let me make a little fraction. Or you could adjust on divide there. Okay, to the power of 5. And we're done. 2,000. Uh, 375.37. Okay, but be very careful. And the question says how much interest. This is how much she has right now. To get the interest, we have to subtract 2,000. We get 375.37 is the amount of interest. Okay, next question, how much is Judo's investment worth? So we won't be subtracting this time. We want to know how much it's actually worth. So in this case, the future value is 2,000 times 1 plus 3% is his interest rate. But K is 12 this time. So we have 12 times 100 down here to the power of 5 times 12. And let me just uh, put that on the calculator again. Uh, so 2,000 times 1 plus, uh, for y equals, get that fraction, 3 out of, oops, plus 1,200. And this is 5 times 12. I know that's 60. You can write 5 times 12 up there. Oops. I made a mistake because that's not to the power of. Let me press to the power of 60. So 2,000. Oh, it's 232323. Two, three, two, three. So that's easy to remember. 232323 three, three, three dollars. Part C. Calculate the number of years that it will take Luigi's investment to triple. So Luigi's uh, investment, if it triple, triples, then that's sixteen thousand or six thousand dollars. So we're calculating when that will be tripled. So let's use the formula. Uh, he's got a three point five percent interest rate, and this is going to be x. So what we do is we graph. We graph on the GDC. We graph. Y1, we graph 2,000 times 1 plus 3.5 out of 100 to the power of x. And in Y2, we're going to graph 6,000 and find the point of intersection. All right, let's get ready for that. All right, so under Y equals, let's do 2,000 times 1 plus... Oops, 
point five divided by a hundred to the power of x. And in y two we'll graph six thousand. Okay, before I press graph, I know my window needs to go up to at least six thousand. So the y max maybe six thousand or seven thousand so I can see the point of intersection. X value I'm guessing maybe twenty years, maybe thirty years. Let's go for thirty. Definitely not a negative number of years, so that should work. Let's see if we can see the point of intersection. Okay, it's actually more than thirty years, so let me change X max to fifty. Okay, so now I can see the point of intersection. Just go second function calc. Intersect is number five. Enter, enter, enter. So it's 31.9 years. Okay, so let me just sketch that graph. We got a vertical line here. This is the x-axis, y-axis. We have this thing here, and then the point of intersection is 31.9 comma of oh, well, it's going to be 6,000, of course. Okay, so x equals 31.9 so it takes 31.9 years to reach 6,000. Okay next looks like we have a calculus question so first one is not too bad just find the derivative you get 4x plus 3. Part B find the gradient at x equals negative 2. Um, so the derivative equals the gradient of a curve. So the the slope is going to be equal to the derivative at negative two, which equals four times negative two plus three, which equals negative eight plus three, which equals negative five. Okay, so negative five is the slope of the tangent line. Uh, all right, so part C, find the equation of the normal to the curve at x equals 2. So let's draw a little picture to see what's going on here. We have a parabola. We have a tangent line here. And we calculated that the slope of the tangent line is negative 5. There's a point there. That point, uh, the x value is negative 2. We don't know the y value yet. Alright, so let's look at so far, well, let's actually draw a sketch of the normal. The normal is perpendicular to the tangent line. So the slope is negative reciprocal, which is positive one-fifth. Alright, so the slope of the normal line equals one-fifth. We know a point on the normal line is negative two, and we haven't got the y value yet, but once we get a point and we have the slope, we can find the equation. So we need to find the y value here. The y value we calculate with the original function here. So 2 times negative 2 squared plus 3 times negative 2. We get 2 times 4 minus 6, which is 8 minus 6, which is 2. So two, negative 2, 2 is that point right there. So now we can find the equation of the normal. It's going to be y equals one-fifth x plus b and then substitute in a point to that point it's the only one we have so we'll substitute that in and solve for b um, so that's going to be 2 equals negative 2 fifths plus b I like to get rid of fractions by multiplying by 5 get 10 equals negative 2 plus 5b don't forget that 5 times the b so 12 equals 5b divided by 5. Get b equals 12 fifths. So the equation of the normal is y equals the slope is 1 fifth and the y intercept is 12 fifths.